Mr Speaker, I welcome the fall in unemployment for, for all of those people who have found work. It's good for them and good for their families. And on the subject of high-skilled jobs in the UK, following the appearance of Pfizer at the Select Committee yesterday, can the Prime Minister tell us what further assurances he's seeking from Pfizer about their takeover of AstraZeneca? Well, first of all, can I welcome the fact that he has welcomed the fall in unemployment? These are, of course, jobs that he predicted would never come to Britain and would never be there. But it is important because what we see today is the largest ever quarterly increase in the number of people in work, 283,000. We see unemployment coming down, youth unemployment coming down, long-term unemployment coming down, and long-term youth unemployment coming down, with, of course, in our growing economy, where our long-term economic plan is working, we see the number of vacancies uh, going up. Honourable members may be interested to know, in addition, that three-quarters of the new jobs over the last year have gone to UK nationals, and also that the employment of Romanians and Bulgarians actually went down in the first three months of this year following the lifting of the controls, which I think is notable. In terms of Pfizer and AstraZeneca, this government has been absolutely clear that the right thing to do is to get stuck in to seek the best possible guarantees on British jobs, on British investment and British science. Now, we discussed this last week, and the most, one of the most important things we've learnt since last week is that the right honourable gentleman was asked for a meeting with Pfizer, but he said he was too busy political campaigning. He quite literally put party politics ahead of the national interest. I'm not going to take any lectures from the guy. I'm really not going to take any lectures from the guy who was negotiating, who was negotiating with Pfizer over the heads of the board of AstraZeneca. Yeah. Pfizer doesn't need a PR man. They've got the prime minister. Yeah. Now, now, for members on all sides, for members on all sides of the house. The appearance of Pfizer at the Select Committee raised more questions than it answered about the so-called assurances. The head of Pfizer said there will be a fall in research and development spending as a result of the takeover. Has the Prime Minister got an assurance that these R&D cuts will not take place in the UK? We want the strongest possible guarantees, but I have to ask him, what is the way of getting those guarantees? Is it getting stuck in with Pfizer and AstraZeneca, battling for the British interest, or is it standing back like he's done, doing absolutely nothing apart from playing politics? That is the point I would put to him. Now, I'm clear what the British interest is. It is British jobs, British science, British R&D, and we'll do everything we can to make those guarantees that we've received and he would have got nothing as firm as possible. But as we do so, let us remember this. 175,000 employed in life sciences in our country because of, we are an open economy that encourages investment. Eli Lilly, Novartis, Johnson & Johnson, Esai, they've chosen to come and invest here because it's a great company to come and do business. The, the, the problem is, Mr Speaker, that his assurances are vague, have caveats, and are inappropriate. Not my words, but the words of the President of the Royal Society. His assurances are useless, and there's no guarantee on R&D. Now let's talk about jobs. On jobs, the head of Pfizer said yesterday, and I quote, there will be job cuts somewhere. Has he got an assurance that these job cuts won't take place in the UK? We, we have assurances on the percentage of R&D that will happen here, on investment in Cambridge, on investment in Macclesfield. Does he, if he's arguing, do we want further assurances? Yes, we do. Do we want to make sure those jobs stay here? Yes, we do. Do we want more investment in British universities and British science? Yes, we do. The only difference between us is how do you get those things? I say get stuck in, negotiate hard, fight for Britain. He says stand up, play politics and put that before the national interest. But, his, but Mr Speaker, his negotiations... His, his negotiations aren't working. They're worthless. On R&D, on jobs, he has no answer. Now let's try him on another one, the possible carving up of the merged company. 
Nobody wants a company to be bought, split up and then sold off. Has he got assurances that won't happen in the case of this takeover? What we want is what we want is a good outcome for British investment and British jobs. But we know what happens if you take the approach of the Labour Party. Let us remember Kraft and Cadbury. What did we have? We had outright opposition, wonderful speeches about blocking investment, and then complete and abject surrender and the closure of plants under Labour. That is what happened. We've learnt the lessons of the mistakes Labour made. We're operating under the framework that they left us, incidentally, which he wrote while he was at the Treasury, and we will get results for British science, British jobs and investment by being engaged rather than standing off and playing politics. We all know what happened the last time he got assurances. He sold off Royal Mail at a knockdown price, and the, cha- and the Chancellor's best man made a killing. That's what happens with his assurances. Now, now the truth is, the truth is he can't, he can't give us a guarantee. He can't give us a guarantee because the chief executive says, and I quote, he wants to conserve the optionality of splitting up the company and flogging it off. Now, last week, the Prime Minister said he would judge the takeover on British jobs, British investment and British science. But he can't offer us assurances on any of those things. Isn't it obvious he should have a proper test of the public interest? And if the deal doesn't pass, he should block it. Once again, he raises this issue about the public interest test. It is worth asking which party, which government, indeed which individual, when he was sitting in the Treasury writing the rules, got rid of that test. It was the right honourable gentleman. That is what we see on a day when unemployment is down, on a day when more people are in work. He will try any trick other than to talk about what is happening in our economy. That's the truth. The country is getting stronger and he is getting weaker. Mr Speaker, he may not think it's important to talk about a company that is 2% of UK exports on which 30,000 jobs depend. It is important. It is crucial to our national interest. And the truth is, and the truth is, he's not powerless. He's the Prime Minister. He could act on a public interest test. We're talking about one of our most important companies. Nobody is convinced by his assurances. And why won't he intervene, Mr Speaker? Because he's falling back on the old idea that the market always knows best and doesn't need rules. From Royal Mail to AstraZeneca, this is a Prime Minister whose ideology means he cannot stand up for the national interest. Yeah. If he thinks these companies are important, why didn't he meet with them rather than going canvassing? Yeah. That is what he did. He quite literally put his own party political interest ahead of the national interest. And what he fails to understand is, yes, we measure the British interest in British jobs, British science and British investment, but we also measure it on being a country that is open to overseas investment. There's a reason why companies and countries are coming here to make cars, to build aeroplanes, to build trains, to fabricate oil rigs, to make new drugs in our country. It's because we've cut taxes, we welcome investment, we're growing our economy and we've got more people in work. We will take absolutely no lectures from the people who brought this economy to their knees. Yeah.